Hi there, I'm Jason Harlow. Today's pre-class video is on the first two sections of chapter 9 of Wolfson. And as you can see, the two sections are center of mass and momentum. So the basic idea here is that up until now, if we have an object like this angry bird, uh, we've been treating it as if it's a particle. So if there's forces acting on it, or and you're drawing a free body diagram, or you're looking at its motion as a projectile through space. The fact that it has shape or size or that it's rotating, we've been ignoring all of those things and treating it as if it's one uh, particle. And chapter 9 as well as 10, 11, and 12, so these next four chapters are about treating uh, systems of particles, things that are stuck together and that can uh, rotate or have, have a center of mass, have momentum. And if you look at the uh, picture there and the quote above, it says that most part of this dancer's body undergo complex motions during this jump. Yet one special point follows the parabolic trajectory of a projectile. What is that point and why is it special? Well, we're going to learn about that in section 9.1. Okay, so the center of mass of a big object or some system of particles is the point where, from the standpoint of Newton's second law, the mass acts as though it were concentrated. Basically, uh, remember, M Newton's second law is that the external force on an object or system equals the mass times its acceleration. So the center of mass is where you can s uh, pretend that all of that mass is concentrated. And if you want to find it, it's the weighted average of the positions of the individual particles where you weight by the mass of those individual particles. So if you have a little index, I, uh, which is a number running from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to the number of particles, then this capital sigma means that you're summing the products of each particle's mass times its position, its vector position, and uh, adding those all up, adding up all those products, and then dividing by uh, capital M, where capital M is the total system mass, the sum of just all the mi's. And that'll give you the position of the center of mass. And that can be done in one dimension or in two dimensions. We'll do an example next in two dimensions. Okay, so in example 9.2, uh, the figure shows a space station consisting of three modules arranged in an equilateral triangle connected by struts of length L of negligible mass. Two modules have mass M, and the other one, 2M, find the center of mass. So our strategy will be to neglect the struts and treat the system as three particles and use this position of the center of mass uh, equation from our book. Okay, so the first step is to label these three particles. We'll go from left to right, uh, one, two, and three. Okay, uh, the coordinate system has already been set up with the origin at this uh, 2m, uh, x going towards the right and plus y going down. So that's handy. And now this equation for center of mass can be split into the x center of mass and the y center of mass. And we'll just apply both those equations in turn. So let's start with the x center of mass. It's going to be m1x1 plus m2x2 plus m3x3 divided by m1 plus m2 plus F m3. Plugging in all those numbers, we have m times negative x1 plus uh, 2m times 0, because that's at the origin, plus m times plus x1 divided by 4m is the total mass. That's going to be negative mx1 plus mx1. Those will cancel, and you'll get 0. And that you could have seen by symmetry. Uh, you expect that since the, uh, the object is symmetric around the origin horizontally, the center of mass should be at the, at the origin in the x direction. Okay, so next we do the same basic equation for y. m1y1 plus m2y2 plus m3y3 over m1 plus m2 plus m3. Plugging those all in, uh, m1 times plus y1 plus 2m times 0 plus m3 times plus y1 over 4m. And so in that case, you just got 2m times y1 over 4m. The m's cancel, you just get y1 over 2, where y1 have to draw the uh, triangle there. So this is half the equilateral triangle. There's 60 degrees. Uh, there's the right angle. The opposite is y1. The hypotenuse is L. So we will use uh, sine 60 degrees is equal to opposite over uh, hypotenuse. So solving for y1 and plugging that in, we've got L sine 60 over 2 is the y position of the center of mass. And plugging into my calculator, I get 0 0.43 is sine 60 over 2. 
So the uh, total position of the center of mass in x and y is 0, 0, 0.43 L. And if you have a continuous distribution of matter, uh, then you need to do an integral. And so imagine you have some big volume of mass uh, and you each and you set up a coordinate system where the origin is somewhere, maybe over here, then you can divide this whole mass into a whole lot of little delta m's or dm's in the limit of uh, small dm's. And then do an integral of the position of each dm times uh, dm, and this is a volume integral. And then divide it by the total mass of that object. So let's definitely do an example of that. So example 9.3 from your text says a supersonic aircraft wing is an isosceles triangle of length L, width W, and negligible thickness. It has mass M distributed uniformly over the wing. Where is its center of mass? So this is a continuous mass distribution. We need an integral. There's a nice little diagram of it. They've already set up the XY coordinates with the origin at the pointy part of the wing and the X axis right down the center of the wing. So by symmetry, the y position of the center of mass must be zero. So we need to do an integral to find the x position of the center of max. Integral of x dm over m, and that's equation one. m is the total mass. So little dm is the mass of this shaded little strip here that's located at position x. So we can approximate this as a, a rectangle. Uh, it's gonna have height h as defined in that diagram, and width dx, so its area, area of the strip, will be uh, h times dx, okay? Uh, the mass density of this whole wing uh, in kilograms per meter squared, so area density, will be the, uh, we'll call it rho, the mass of the wing divided by the total area of the wing. Uh, the total area of the wing we can find from that big triangle uh, the wing is length L and uh, width W, so it's one half base times height. It's going to be a half times L times W. So uh, rho there, the density of the wing is m over one half LW or two m over LW. And so now we can write the area, uh, the mass of the strip, is going to be uh, it's uh, the area of the strip HDX times rho, two m over LW and we'll call that equation two. That's the mass of the strip. And h here is a function of x. It gets wider as x gets longer. So there's a little triangle showing you go uh, x distance. It's h over two above the x-axis. Whereas for the whole wing, it's l uh, and your w two over the whole axis. Those are similar triangles. So you can compare h over two to x it is comparable to w over two over l. And you can solve that equation out for h h over x equals w over l, so h equals x times w over l. And now we can plug that h into our equation for the mass of the strip, equation 2. dm now is equal to xw over l times dx times the mass density 2m over lw. And now these w's cancel, uh, so dm is 2m over l squared times x dx. Now we're ready to plug this into equation one. X center of mass is the integral of x dm over m. So it's one over m times the integral of x times dm. And we'll just plug in our equation for dm. And now we can rearrange all that and pull the constants out front and just leave everything with x inside the integral. It's x squared dx. And if you remember, the integral goes from x equals zero at the pointy part of the wing out to l uh, at the end of the wing. So that's your integration limits. Uh, also, the m's cancel there. So the constant is just 2 over l squared. And the integral of x squared is just x cubed over 3, integrated from 0 to l. So plugging that in, it's 2 over l squared times l cubed over 3 minus 0. Uh, the l cubed cancels the l squared. You get 2 thirds l. So that's uh, the position, x position of the center of mass. And it's closer to the thicker part of the wing. So I assess that to, to make sense. Okay, and if you have multiple objects, uh, each which are continuous, like maybe the wing, and you know its center of mass here is two thirds away from this pointy part, two thirds of the length away from the pointy part, and you've got uh, the fuselage of the rest of the airplane, not the wing. If its center of mass is right here in the middle of the airplane, you can uh, treat the wing and the fuselage as point particles 
uh, at their centers of mass with their respective masses and use that original equation for uh, discrete masses to find the center of mass of the whole plane. And also the object center of mass does not need to lie within the object. If you have a curved object like this, where do you think the uh, center of mass would be, A, B, or C? Uh, okay, I'll tell you. I think it's actually A, and I was able to kind of think about that as if I um, broke this up into horizontal strips. I'd have these long strips up here, and then a whole lot of little teeny strips out here. And so if you try to imagine where the average uh, Y position of all these masses are, uh, B is way too low because you've got a lot of mass up here. So I think A is, is better. And C definitely is not. That. C would be, I guess, the center if you had a whole ring, not just half a ring. And here is, uh, here's a curved guy uh, who's curving his back so that his center of mass is located outside his body below there. So he can um, give enough initial velocity uh, to get his center of mass actually under the bar, but if he wraps his back like that, he can go over, he can physically clear the bar uh, without knocking it over, and so he gets another extra couple of inches and maybe can, can win the high jump. Okay, so the idea here is the center of mass obeys Newton's second law. So whatever the ec net external force is, it's the total mass of the object times the acceleration of the center of mass. So here we have some complex, it's a, it's a hammer rotating, so you've got a lot of internal forces holding the hammer together, uh, but its center of mass just follows this red uh, line, which is just that same nice parabola that we have, um, that have figured out in previous chapters. So in the absence of any external forces on a system, if there is no gravity, then the center of mass remains unchanged. If it's at rest, it remains at rest. Uh, if it's going constant velocity in a straight line, it will continue doing that, no matter what the internal forces are inside that object. And that's a, a useful way of solving some problems. So moving on now, I want to talk about momentum again. Remember, uh, momen momentum is a property of moving thing. It's it's defined, we defined it way back a, uh, a few chapters ago as the mass of an object multiplied times its velocity. Its equation is uh, P equals MV. P is the vector symbol for momentum. Uh, the units are kilograms times meters per second. And this big tanker has a lot of momentum because it's moving at some high speed and it's got a huge mass. So the center of mass obeys Newton's law, which can be written as F equals ma, or equivalently uh, F net is dp by dt, where p, capital P now, is the total momentum of the system. That's going to be the sum of the momenta of all the particles of, this, of the system. So I, here's the index, uh, and you're summing over the momentum of every single particle. That's going to be equal to the total mass of the system times the velocity of the center of mass. And the acceleration of the center of mass is going to be dv by dt. So when the net external force on the system is zero, then the uh, time derivative of the total momentum equals zero. So that means that the total momentum of the system is constant if there's no external forces. And again, that's, that's going to be pretty useful for us. That's called conservation of linear momentum. Okay, so to show an example of how this can work, we'll look at a massive cannon that's firing a cannonball, which has a lower mass. So bam! It shoots it, and out comes this red cannonball at a high velocity. Uh, it's frictionless ground, so there's no horizontal external force. So that means, I mean, what's going on here is the force on the cannonball inside the cannon barrel is equal and opposite to the force of the cannonball on the cannon. So since this ball gains a whole bunch of momentum, at the same time, the cannon gains an equal amount of momentum in the opposite direction. So before the ball is fired, the system has zero horizontal momentum, uh, and then after the ball is fired, 
again, the total momentum of the system is zero because you've got a positive momentum from the ball and an equal, uh, negative, equal magnitude of negative momentum uh, for the cannon. So there's a conceptual example in your textbook, 9.1, which says that Jess, J here, mass 53 kilograms, and Nick, who has a mass of 72 kilograms, are sitting inside a 27 kilogram kayak at rest on frictionless water. So you don't, they're not paddling or anything. Uh, and then Jess tosses Nick a 17 kilogram pack giving it a horizontal speed of 3.1 meters per second relative to the water. And it says, what is the kayak speed after Nick catches the pack? And it's shown in this diagram here that the answer is just zero. You don't have to do any calculations. And the idea here is that uh, it's conservation of momentum. There are no horizontal forces, no, no external horizontal force acting on the system, pushing them to the left or the right. So if you take the system of Jess and the uh, backpack and Nick and the kayak as these four objects, initially everything's at rest, right? They're all sitting still relative to the water and then finally they're all sitting still. So the kayak can't have picked up any speed from before to after because there's no external forces, they're not paddling. And then it's uh, asking you to make a connection. What's the kayak's speed while the pack is in the air? Well, you have to then actually do a calculation in that case. So now, while the pack is in the air, it has some uh, velocity, 3.1 meters per second relative to the water to the right. And so all the rest of these objects, uh, the kayak plus Jess plus Nick, must have a velocity towards the left to give their momentum to the left to have an equal magnitude of the pack's momentum to the right. And so you do uh, mj plus mn plus m kayak times v of the kayak. You solve that out for v of kayak and I got negative uh, 0.35 meters per second. And this also works in two dimensions uh, which we'll get onto in the next uh, in the next video on collisions. If you have a cue ball going along here on a we're looking overhead now at a pool table. Initially these two balls are at rest and all the momentum is in this cue ball straight towards the right, so maybe along the x direction. And then afterwards, uh, the uh, cue ball is returning to the left, so it's changed its momentum, picked up some negative momentum, and that's what gives these two balls their, their positive x direction momentum. And the other thing that can happen is that the, the, the two ball can go up and uh, have some y component of its momentum, but there was no y component to the initial momentum, so that means the 11 ball must have an equal and opposite uh, y momentum in the negative direction. And so you can see there's all sorts of applications for conservation of momentum, and we'll return to it in the next video, but until then, I'll see you in class.